Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm Jesse Van Tal, the President and CEO of NCRC. Um, and we're delighted to be here. Uh, as you all know, last week, the Community Reinvestment Act rules were released, the first significant overhaul of the laws implementing regulations since the 1990s. I'm thrilled to get to talk about what this will mean for the communities you serve with the leaders of the agencies that undertook uh, that really significant uh, rulemaking. Uh, we have here today Michael Sue, Acting Comptroller of the Currency, Martin Gruenberg, uh, Chair of the FDIC, and Michael Barr, Vice Chair of Supervision at the Federal Reserve. Uh, thank you all for joining us today and, and congratulations on this historic um, achievement, uh, major undertaking. Uh, before we get started, I just want to acknowledge um, this is the start of unpacking this 1500 page rule. Uh, the three agencies spent uh, several years working on this, uh, and we're now moving into the marathon after the marathon, uh, where NCRC members uh, and, and others will be working to evaluate, assess, uh, analyze the rule. Uh, we'll certainly be following up with our members uh, about the changes to the rule, what it means for the work we're doing to build a just economy, and how it might open the door uh, to some new possibilities for all of us. Uh, for those of you on this webinar, um, some things to be on the lookout for. Uh, during the webinar, I'll be asking um, some questions uh, of the three agency heads, but we'll also be sharing some polling questions with you to give you a chance to weigh in on what you're most interested in hearing about uh, from NCRC related to the new rule. Uh, we want to uh, help make sure we're responsive uh, to what you need to understand uh, this enormous rule. And on Thursday, December 7, at 1.30 p.m., we'll be taking a deeper dive into this rule with our members. Uh, so for those of you who are NCRC members, please join us then. If you're not a, a member that gives you a month to join us as a member, uh, we'd be happy to have you. We'll also be scheduling a follow-up uh, session with the regulatory staff who worked on this rule to dive even deeper uh, into the rule. And we'll be producing a written content breaking down particular aspects of the rule over the course of the next several months. Um, and your participation in the surveys today uh, will absolutely help us inform where we put our focus uh, for that content. Finally, uh, we want to make sure you're at the Just Economy Conference uh, this spring. Join us April 2 to 4, as we'll be teeing up important conversations there as well. Um, now that we've got all of that in, uh, let's dive in. Uh, we have these three gentlemen for an hour on, on this historic rulemaking. Um, so we'll just jump in uh, first uh, with a question to, to Chair Gruenberg. Um, you know, this was a, a significant undertaking. Um, what updates to CRA do you think will be the most successful? in achieving the goal of expanding access to credit investment and banking services for borrowers with low to moderate incomes and in LMI communities? Well, Jesse, first, thanks for the question. And let me say a word about um, NCRC's role in leadership in regard to advocating for the Community Reinvestment Act. Your organization has really been the foundation of community group advocacy and attention to the rulemaking of CRA and the implementation of CRA. And we certainly uh, hope and expect you will continue to play that role. The, the, the finalizing this rule was a, uh, a, a big challenge. Uh, implementing it effectively in order to realize its potential is really the the challenge in front of us now. We told our respective staffs they could take a night off, get a good night's sleep, and then start thinking about implementation. So, but we certainly expect to be working with with you and and many in your organization as we as we work hard to to realize the possibilities of the rulemaking. 
and and the possibilities are very large. And um, I've used the word transformational to describe this rulemaking, and uh, I, I don't think it's it's an overstatement. It's easily the most consequential rulemaking since the last major revision in 1995. But in some ways, you really have to go back to the enactment of CRA in 1977 to uh, consider the consequence of this rule. Because from its inception, CRA was really focused on, built around the facility-based assessment area. And that was the focus and the limitation of CRA. And as we all understand, the nature of the business of banking over the last 25 years has changed dramatically. And a significant amount of the lending that banks do is no longer tied to a branch, to a facility-based uh, assessment area. So if we didn't make CRA relevant to the lending that banks do not tied to a branch, but still may be quite significant in many communities around the country, over time, CRA would become increasingly relevant. We have banks today with one branch, with no branches, yet nationwide lending activity. And if we don't have a means of capturing that lending activity and holding it accountable to serving all of the neighborhoods in a given community, then the relevance and significance of CRA would really diminish over time. And that's really what we do with the retail lending assessment areas. I think if there are two things, there, there's a bunch of stuff. I don't want to, and I want to give others a chance to talk, but the two things that are really um, transformational are the making CRA relevant, to communities where the bank may not have a physical location and developing a detailed set of metrics and benchmarks that will now complement the qualitative evaluations that are done. Both will, will be of great importance. I don't want to undervalue uh, the importance of the qualitative review, but at the same time, having a set of metrics and benchmarks that can be used to uh, evaluate and hold banks accountable for their community lending activity is really an additional new dimension of CRA. You put those two things together and you really begin to get a sense of the consequence of this rule. There's a lot of other stuff, but why, why don't I, I stop there and I guess as my colleagues may have something to, to add as well. Yeah, and welcome anybody into this conversation. I mean, that's really right. If you had done nothing else, this is really the first time in CRA's entire history that the regulatory framework will assess all lending done under CRA between retail lending assessment areas and the outside retail lending assessment areas. Um, you're for the first time assessing all lending, and it can't be understated both how necessary that was to modernize CRA and ensure its ongoing relevance, uh, but also how impactful that will be. Um, so, so Michael and Michael, uh, the two Michaels, uh, I guess I, I needed a better way to handle that. To, um, if you have thoughts, please chime in and, and I'll keep it. Uh, I, I might say just, just a couple words. Um, first of all, let me join uh, Chair Grunberg in thanking NCRC and your member organizations and all the individuals and banks and civil rights groups and community organizations and social service agencies all around the country who worked with NCRC and other commenters to provide input into the proposal and then into the final rule. The input that we got from the public, from communities, and as Marty said, especially from NCRC proved invaluable to us in making this the rule that, that it is today. And that kind of community input is gonna be really essential in the next phase of implementation. Uh, community engagement has always been at the core of what CRA is about. And with this new framework, that's gonna to continue to be the case. So we need 
community engagement to continue um, through this implementation process. And I, I think that'll benefit, uh, it'll benefit us as regulators, it'll benefit communities, it'll benefit the banks who are serving uh, their entire communities. So I really, uh, really wanna emphasize that. L let me just also mention one other uh, aspect of, of the final rule that I think um, will be really helpful to people. We've heard over the years that uh, both banks and community groups need greater clarity about what counts and what doesn't count for CR CRA purposes. And so one of the things this rule does is set out a set of illustrative practices that are going to be uh, eligible for CRA consideration and also provides a process that can confirm if somebody's unsure about whether something counts or doesn't count, they can come ask us and we'll say, yeah, that's, that's good. That counts for CRA and share that um, with others. So it, I think that both the illustrative list and the process for confirming eligible activities will be really useful both to communities and banks in the years ahead. I think that's right. You know, you hear uh, certainly much has been made of the 1500 page rule. People say, well, that sounds complex. Um, and I think for your average CRA officer looking at a transition period, uh, maybe it seems like there's a lot of unknowns, but now there's a lot of knowns. There's a lot of clarity and transparency. Uh, and 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 Michael Su, I know that was a, a, a an important factor for all of us, but yep. also acknowledge the role the OCC played uh, yeah. in, in pushing that concept and framework forward. Yeah, I want to I want to echo first of all uh, what what um, Marty and Mike uh, Michael said about the role of NCRC and the groups and really helping us to get this to the final rule. Uh, you know, I I often say to folks here, uh, faster alone, farther together. And you, know, you can do things quickly all by yourself, but it's really when you when you take all of that input, you get a better product. It takes a little bit more time, but it'll last. And I think that's that's been very, very important to us is that we've got a rule that's durable uh, and that can last. One thing I would um, maybe um, kind of add to what uh, Marty and Michael highlighted in terms of really critical things that I, I feel like just are really, really critical about this final rule. When we set out to do this, our overarching objectives were to modernize and to strengthen the CRA. And I think Marty did a great job of explaining the modernization part because that's that's absolutely critical. But we also want to strengthen it. And when people ask, well, what do you mean by strengthen it? You know, I boil it down to three things: more, better, faster. Like there has to be just more uh, activity. It has to be better targeted to the communities, and it should be faster. And you know, Michael touched on this last on and faster is that. Certainty was sometimes hanging things up, you know, particularly on community development activities, either from the banks or from uh, community groups. Does it qualify? Does it not qualify? And one of the things that we did in the rule was to provide a bit more clarity and confidence on that. You know, now the 95 rule has got kind of four you know, CD areas. Now we've got 11, and that includes things like uh, uh, you know, disaster preparedness, weather resiliency, uh, activities in native lands. Uh, and then as Michael uh, hinted at, you know, the, the goal is to publish a non-exhaustive illustrative list of activities um, that will be updated periodically. And we've got a process, uh, a formal mechanism to sub submit requests. And it's the expectation that we, three, the three agencies work together on that. And I think that, again, that, that will strengthen it, uh, make it durable and allow for the kind of certainty that can enable uh, more more engagement and better outcomes for everybody. I think that's right. And you know, you hear you hear certainly some uh, even complaints about this rule that that because it's long, maybe it seems like it's complex, but actually something can be clear and transparent. And to your point, uh, Michael, more 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 rigorous, more difficult. I think the articulated goal of the three agencies all along was to raise the bar while also making it clearer um, and creating more certainty. And I certainly think you've done that. Uh, Michael, Sue, I wanna uh, drill into, um, you know, certainly much has been made of the retail lending assessment areas, uh, uh, and the retail lending assessment, and we're gonna talk more about that, but you brought into the conversation, uh, you know, the updates to the CRA definition of community development. 
is going to have a significant impact on banks' community development portfolios. Um, incorporating climate resiliency um, is fairly significant. But but what what impact do you think it will have overall on 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 banks' interest in 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 other areas, including health services, community solar projects, uh, impact in native lands? Yeah. Um, it, it, it does, uh, in some ways, broaden the aperture, but also um, uh, perhaps improves the qualitative factor and focus as well. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. Because there's a there's a there's two things you want to accomplish, which is that you know, community development is an evolving concept, and so you want to make sure we've got um, kind of the flexibility and broad enough aperture to cover those. And at the same time, we want rigor. We need rigor with that to ensure that those dollars have maximum impact on uh, communities of need, you know, the LMI communities. And that, that striking that balance, we think we've done that through both um, uh, some process uh, that, that we put in place uh, and also uh, with some specificity on the, some of the substance. And that, that does require, that adds to the page count. But I like, like you said, Jesse, that we think that that page count is, is well worth it. Uh, because it provides that certainty, which can enable uh, those act those dollars to flow. Thank you. I'll see if your colleagues have any more to say about that before I move on. Yeah, I'd, Michael, did you want to go first? Um, I'd add uh, the the uh, changes to the community development test are um, are also quite fundamental. Um, because we're really now, in a sense, unleashing the uh, ability of banks to serve underserved communities anywhere in the country and get CRA credit. And the two things, two fundamental things we tried to do with the CD test is one, add flexibility so that a bank can go to a rural community, it can go to a native lands community, it can go to any underserved community in the country and get credit at the same time to focus CD credit on actually serving low and moderate income communities. Under, under this final rule, I do like saying that, I've been saying proposed rule for so darn long. Under this final rule, uh, you only get CD credit if the benefit of the community development activity, whether a loan or an investment, um, you can demonstrate that 50% or more of it benefits the low-income community or low-income households. So you, at the same time, we're trying to target it on the historic mission of CRA and create flexibility so that banks um, uh, really can, can have the aspiration of, of serving bank deserts communities around the country that lack access to services uh, where, wherever. And I think the opportunity side of this rule um, for banks and community organizations to be forward leaning in thinking about new and creative ways to serve communities and use CRA as um, an incentive and leverage for that is, you know, it, it, is really to me one of the exciting things about the rule, and and you really, I mean, you've made it more flexible, broadened the aperture, and also said you can go beyond the assessment, but also more focused, in that you know you get more credit, for example, if you're doing community development investment in areas of persistent poverty. That was a, a concept NCRC really encouraged and appreciative of uh, of, of your efforts to incorporate that. Michael Barr, anything to add before I move on? Yes, yeah, I would just say, you know, one of the areas that people had asked us to provide greater clarity on and, and relates to the community development mission more broadly is support for CDFIs and, and minority depository institutions and low-income credit unions, women-owned credit unions. And the rule provides clear support for bank engagement with these um, really wonderful, innovative organizations all around the country, many of whom I see are, are joining the, uh, the call. Um, and I think that kind of clarity would be really helpful in the, bank, in the partnerships between banks and CDFIs, uh, who are really not only doing great work on the ground 
in local communities, but also are often the ones that have innovative approaches that once they test them out, others, including large banks, small banks, uh, medium-sized banks, will then take the strategy and, and deploy it. And that means more capital is getting into low-income communities. So I think that's just another feature of the a rule that I think is worth, worth highlighting. You know, one of, one of the uh, maybe critiques we have of the final rule, um, of course, redlining uh, was critical to the history of CRA. Redlining was largely a race-based uh, phenomenon. And um, in the final rule, and, and indeed in the proposed rule, race wasn't made an explicit part of the performance test. But you have incorporated um, concepts that um, relate to integration, uh, relate to serving underserved communities broadly. Um, we've seen state CRA laws incorporate race uh, into the construct. What, what do you see um, as the major obstacles, but also opportunities to think about um, how we address all underserved communities, um, uh, given the law's focus on low and moderate income communities? Well, Jesse, it's, a, it's an excellent question. Look, let me start by saying what, what all, all your members know, but I'll just say out loud, you know, the role of race has been central um, in, in our financial system. There, for far too long, there has been discrimination uh, in our financial markets and our housing markets. That was true in government programs and, and true in the private sector. So there is a, a very long and uh, really uh, tragic um, history of discrimination uh, in this country. And the Community Reinvestment Act was one of a set of laws that, that Congress passed in order to uh, begin to attack this problem of discrimination alongside the Equal Credit Opportunity Act and the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act and the Fair Housing Act and other provisions designed to uh, get at discrimination. We were able uh, in the final rule uh, to, in some targeted ways, uh, make sure that we understood the role of race in our society. Um, one of the important things that we were able to do in the final rule, for example, is make it clear that all special purpose credit programs which are programs designed to overcome that history of racial discrimination, qualify under the Community Reinvestment Act for consideration. Uh, a second thing we were able to do in the final rule is to uh, provide uh, transparency to the public. Um, so under the final rule, Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data will be provided assessment area by assessment area. And that's a way for uh, the community to understand um, how banks are performing um, using that, uh, that element of transparency. We also have a provision, as is the case under our, the current rule, that if a bank engages in illegal or discriminatory credit practices, that those practices will be taken into account in the CRA uh, evaluation. We have limits on the ability of banks to set their assessment area that can't do that in a way that is um, evasive of uh, basic principles of fairness, uh, including on issues of, of race. Uh, so these are examples um, of, of the way we've been able to, to take that into account. And as I mentioned in the prior answer, we also have an explicit um, uh, call out, uh, call in um, for minority depository institutions, making it clear that supporting minority depository institutions is an eligible activity under the CRA. So we were able to bring these factors in, but we understand that you know, it, CRA is only one of a broader set of tools uh, that are necessary to help get at the problem of racial discrimination in our society. Thank you. Uh, so to, um... You know, our, our studies, our research continues to show evidence of discrimination and, and discouragement for underserved businesses, including businesses owned by, by women and people of color. Um, so really two, two components, uh, uh, Michael Barr. One is um, uh, really business lending, uh, which has always been a part of CRA, but 
uh, in the future with the incorporation of 1071 data is is uh, going to have a finer analysis to it. So in a way, um, maybe there's been a perception that home mortgage lending was more important than the concept of CRA in the past. Uh, so, so in a way, business lending clearly on on a level playing field um, within CRA today. Um, but also, what impact do you see the final rule having on on those kinds of underserved businesses? Well, Jesse, let me let me start by saying I, I agree with you that um, small business lending is absolutely critical. Um, small businesses are the lifeblood of their communities and really essential uh, for job creation uh, all over the country. And so it's really critical that um, we have a rule, as we do, that uh, supports small business lending. Uh, small business lending, um, as you also point out, has a, a history um, and a current practice in many respects of having uh, racial discrimination still present. And I've seen that in my, in my own research, my own academic research. I've seen that um, persistence of uh, uh, discriminatory impact um, on on uh, uh, minority uh, business owners, and so I do think we need to uh, focus on strategies that help ensure that uh, banks are meeting the needs of small businesses around the country. Uh, we do that in a variety of ways in the rule. We we especially um, call out um, uh, for uh, consideration small business lending. Uh, that uh, banks do, it's specially evaluated. We include a small business metric in the retail lending assessment area uh, approach alongside uh, one for home mortgages. We have a special focus on very small businesses um, and these businesses are often um, disproportionately minority owned. Uh, very small businesses are given extra consideration uh, under the rule. So these are examples of, of ways that I think that the final rule will uh, significantly support uh, banks being encouraged to lend to small businesses. And, and I'll just note, um, you know, on both of these previous two points, um, you know, C CRA is not the end all and be all when it comes to um, either encouraging more credit to small businesses or or addressing the racial inequities we, we see in our society. So certainly we have advocated for uh, uh, enhancements on the fair lending side uh, and, and on other types of, of restorative uh, practices and, and policies uh, to address uh, racial wealth inequality. And, you know, as, as you mentioned, the, the CFPB's 1071 rule is, is also going to shine a light uh, very much in this area. Yeah. Uh, Marty or, or, or Michael Sue, anything to add uh, on these two topics? No, frankly, uh, I, think, I think Michael covered it pretty well, but I think small business was very much a focus of the, uh, of the rulemaking. And particularly, I think, particularly smaller businesses. Yeah, and, and the only thing I would add is that you know, we, we recently hosted um, an SPCP, a special purpose credit program event um, with CFPB and HUD and FHFA. And you know, a couple of things were striking about that. You know, of course, those are, those are uh, uh, really encouraged and incentivized within the, 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 the final rule. But part of that, which this loops all the way back to something that Michael, you had opened with, folks really wanted, felt it was very important to remind us of the historical legacy that we are operating, the context that we're operating in. And I think that that's important for us as regulators to know and to recognize um, and for community organizations to constantly <laughs> remind us because that, that is an important way to kind of keep um, uh, the, the right level of attention on all of these issues across all the range of tools that we have. Because we've got CRA and Jesse, you just mentioned this, you know, um, uh, enforcement uh, uh, for ECOA, fair housing, like that's all, all of those work together uh, to really address the, the racial wealth gap, uh, which, is, which is something we all care about. Absolutely. Michael, Sue, one, one of the big challenges with updating the CRA is, is, is that it's been so long since it was last updated. Um, and 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 now we have a final rule, so we have an update to the rule. But uh, 
um, uh, you know, the banking industry is a rapidly evolving industry. Um, there are some things left to implementation. Um, how, how the rule gets implemented is really important. And then how you think about um, potential future updates to the rule, whether that's regulatory guidance along the way or, uh, you know, at some point in the future, I'm sure your staff would say very far into the future, uh, uh, another rulemaking, but but indeed uh, the pace of change is such that um, uh, you know we could look forward uh, five ten years from now and say, gee, we really need to revisit some things. How are you all thinking about uh, ensuring across the three agencies um, that as you implement it, uh, one, uh, you remain consistent with each other, and two. Um, that CRI stays up to date and and responsive to community needs going forward. Well, Jesse, I love how we're we're a week in and you're already talking about the next rule. <laughs> so I would say um, a lot of time, care, and attention was put into uh, modernizing this rule and making sure that we're not just calibrating it to the banking system today, but that there is some room to accommodate the banking system of the future. That, that, was, that was very conscious. And that, that, that was, um, you, you see that, I think Marty did a great job of articulating uh, some of the key features uh, of that uh, in the rule when, in his opening uh, comments. To your point, and I, I'll loop back to the, you know, faster loan farther together, in, interagency collaboration on getting this final rule done uh, was really, really critical. And uh, as we implement, you know, the teams are going to continue to work together. There's, I think there's recognition that consistent implementation is in everyone's interest. Um, and, and, and now implementation is different than uh, rulemaking. And in some ways, uh, it's, a, it's a broader group of examiners. It's a broader group of folks. Uh, we've already, folks are already working hard. You know, they, they, they were allowed, they, they celebrated a little bit, which was, uh, we're all we're all still celebra celebrating in a way because this is long overdue. Um, but to your point, getting the implementation is 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 really really critical. And the better we can implement it, I think the less there will be a need to do kind of rule revisions. At the same time, we're going to be very attentive to changes. You know, the banking system changes. We can't predict how the banking system is going to change. Uh, we need to make sure that communities are served. And I think it's really good to anchor back to. The core, you know, the, the foundations of the statute, which is that banks need to serve everybody in, those in their communities that they operate in, uh, especially low and moderate income uh, neighborhoods and individuals. So that's that will animate how we approach it, and uh, we will we depend a, a bit on yourself and your 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 member organizations and your peers to let us know, you know, our communities being are those needs being uh, met. Jesse, if I could add to that. Yeah, please. One of the things I like about this rule is its flexibility and adaptability. So that, you know, with, with these retail lending assessment areas, they can accommodate many different kinds of business models for banks. You know, some banks have a retail branch network, but still do significant lending beyond it. Some banks have a very limited network. Some banks have none and do all of their lending online, but on a region or nationwide basis. This rule can apply CRA to all of those different kinds of business models, which I really think is critical and will allow this rule to remain relevant, I hope for quite a while. I'm not eager to run back to the rule writing table here, but and then similarly on the CD side, you know, providing the flexibility for banks to go to any community, as long as it's focused on serving LMI communities and get credit for a variety of activities. And, you know, in the services area alone, we've really expanded it so that, um, you know, it's it's not just traditional banking services, but it could be job training and workforce development. It can be um, healthcare that's serving the community. It, there's a large range of uh, activities that can benefit from 
uh, community development credit. And Michael, I think, and Mike mentioned before, you know, we're going to we'll have a a um, evolving list of eligible activities, so that uh, it's not static but can evolve over time as banks and communities see new opportunities or new needs. So hopefully this is in some sense a living <clears throat> a living and an and adaptable rule that will provide greater flexibility to allow banks to serve communities across the country in in different ways as the economy and the financial system evolve. So I think that's an important dimension of this. And, and by the way, let me add the importance of engagement by community organizations in this work. You know, the input of community groups who are closest to the ground in terms of the needs of local communities, providing that input to the agencies and to the institutions uh, as they seek to um, implement this rule, uh, I think is is really quite critical. And they really, it, it should be a partnership. That's a word that's used a lot, but the agencies with the in bankers, with the community organizations, um, pooling our resources and knowledge to, to maximize the possibilities here. One of the um, really critical things, if I could just double press on, uh, click on this for a second, because I think, um, you know, there's some things in the rule. Uh, there's a section which says that with regards to the transition, uh, as people transition from the old rule to the new rule, each agency will come up with its own approach. Um, and, and, and I understood that to mean, uh, well, you've got the very real consideration of each and every bank, each and every exam, each and every schedule that you're on. Each agency's got to navigate that with the banks that they supervise. But I think it created some anxiety that, oh, oh, <laughs> as we go here, the agencies are going to diverge again. And what I hear you all saying is really, look, there's, there's first of all, flexibility built into the thing, but a commitment to to, to, to work on these things together on an ongoing basis. Yeah, let me let me just um, reiterate that <laughs> just so it's absolutely clear. We are 100% committed to working together on implementation. Um, we already are looking ahead to implementation and working together. We're going to stay tightly joined at the hip, um, not only on the process for saying what activities are eligible in the future, but all the hard work that's required, we have to do examiner training. We have to develop an examiner manual. We have to develop tools that communities can use and banks can use to understand the performance context. We want to have dashboards that are accessible to the public and to the banks. So all of this work is going to require the three of us staying, three organizations, us personally, but the three organizations staying you know quite closely joined at the hip and we're firmly committed to doing that and, and as you said the role of training really critical and important and important that people remain engaged uh along the way in this process and certainly in crc uh will be doing so um uh marty coming back to you I, i'm sure you've heard um some first impressions of the final rule since its release, any, any anything that has struck you so far about what you've heard, any misconceptions uh, you think should be clarified, um, or points of emphasis that you think are evading people's notice? It's it, it's a little early, Jesse. People, <laughs> to a certain extent, are, are are still digesting the rule. So I I I sort of want to give people a little time. My I think. I think the general reaction we've received is, is quite positive, uh, certainly from the community organizations and civil rights groups. But I think uh, the initial feedback from the banking community, I think, has been fairly positive, although I want to, as I say, give them some opportunity to, to work their way through it. I think um, um, the thing, the point I made previously 
uh, it, it is an ambitious rulemaking. After 25 years, it, it should have been an ambitious rulemaking because so much has changed that we really needed to, to adapt CRA. But, I, I, uh, but what I really find appealing and perhaps is underappreciated is the amount of flexibility it gives to institutions to find new and innovative ways to, to serve uh, LMI communities and to get CRA credit for it. And it's, it's a much more flexible rule than CRA has been in the past. And I, I, I honestly think the opportunity for banks and community organizations to partner with each other, to take advantage of the opportunities that this rule provides is something that you know, is perhaps underappreciated. One of the, you know, I've been around a, a disturbingly long time and I can actually remember my first job shortly after CRA was enacted. I was working for my local congressman in the Bronx and I went to a meeting that was called by one of the community organizations where they invited the bankers. And, you know, Th these were groups of people who really did not know each other before. And one of the things CRA did over its history, and NCRC, I think, is an important example of this, is really bring community organizations and the banking industry together in a collaborative way. And uh, I think this rule will provide more flexibility to take advantage of that. And I'm not sure people yet fully appreciate the possibilities there. So some of the kinds of things I've heard just to, to kind of go deeper on this, um, you know, is the new rule just about quantity as opposed to quality? We've already started to address this, the, the, the qualitative versus quantitative factors. Wanted to give you all a chance to, to follow up on that point. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to say just a word or two about that, Jesse. I, I think that the important thing to us, and this is consistent with my, what Mark, Mike and Marty have said, the important thing to us is that this is actually helping communities. And so that requires, in part, a quantitative approach. You can show with metrics what's going on and whether, whether banks are actually serving their entire community by looking in a quantitative way, in a way that is transparent, in a way that is permits comparability across institutions, but also qualitatively, we wanna know that this at work actually matters, that, that banks are doing innovative work, that banks are doing work that genuinely serves the community. And that requires uh, qualitative inputs. And importantly, as we've been saying, especially inputs from the community that is being served. Because um, that's how you know whether the work is good. <laughs> is it is it actually serving the community? So community input is going to be essential. It's why I mentioned at the outset that I think community input is also really important as we get into this implementation phase, because we want to make sure as we're training examiners, as we're writing our exam books, as we're doing the work online, that we get community input into that so it actually is useful to the communities that the statute is intending banks to serve. Thank you, Mike. Michael, Sue, any, anything that has struck you, a misperception, something that's been unappreciated so far with, with the caveat, as, as, as Chair Grunberg said, that uh, people are still reading the thing. It's still pretty early, but, uh, and, you know, there were a lot of concerns even heading into the final rule that in combining, for example, community development, lending and investment and the CD test that it might disincent yeah. investment that's been addressed uh, in the final rule. Things that people had fears and anxieties about that, that, that we think have been addressed, but, but anything that sticks out to you on that level? Um, well, like Marty, I think people are still, still digesting it, but one tagline you hear a lot is 1500 pages, 1500 pages, 15. That, that seems to be the one factoid people have latched onto um, to implicitly criticize it. I think that um, it's useful to think of it in the way that we talked about it earlier is that we really are trying to provide clarity. Like that clarity, you know, community reinvestment is complicated. There's, there's lots of different aspects to this. 
Um, and we wanna provide clarity on each of those parts. And by providing that clarity, there's just a little bit, both providing the flexibility that Marty was talking about, but also the certainty so that banks and community groups know that that investment, that loan, that activity is gonna help folks and is gonna qualify. And it gets back to you know, what, what Michael just re referenced. We wanna make sure that the outcomes are more activity, it's better targeted, and, and we can do it uh, more quickly. And that's the, ultimately that's gonna be, and if it takes 1500 pages to do that, then <laughs> that's what it takes. Um, I think that as folks digest it, that, that'll be less of a fact. Uh, that'll be less relevant to the fact than the fact that, um, you know, we, we really try to lay out pretty clearly how, how these things should go. And, and I, I do point out to people, you know, the preamble is the bulk of the 1500 pages, <laughs> the, the, the actual sort of legal rule language itself, uh, a small uh, minority of that, but, but very helpful to understand what was considered uh, what wasn't considered. Um, so, so we're going to um, return now, um, uh, Michael Barr, uh, to this, to this really this notion of the retail lending assessment area. It's something that I, th I think has gotten a lot of attention, a lot of conversation. Um, you know, it now evaluates lending done outside of branch networks. Um, and uh, that's pretty significant. Um, so for any a large bank that sits, hits a certain threshold in a particular market and, and do more than 20% of their loans outside the branch network, um, they're now going to have uh, have a retail lending assessment. That was scaled back to a degree in the proposal. Um, why, why was this a, a needed change? Why is it suit the purpose of CRA and 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 what were the trade offs? You you also considered a a, a deposit based framework um, and and opted to go with a retail lending assessment area framework. What were the trade offs that you considered uh, as you did that? Well, Jesse, let me let me start in a bigger picture way. Um, we we really took a both and approach um, to to looking at this. So it's still the case that. Uh, facility-based assessment areas. These are the areas around um, branches and deposit-taking ATMs. Those areas are still really, really critical to the rule, and we kept that um, focus that has been the focus of, of um, the rule for quite some time. So that approach stays, and then we add to it this more flexible approach for the activity that's occurring outside of retail um, assessment, outside of the uh, branch network. And as you pointed out, it really applies, that section really applies for banks that are doing, that are predominantly, um, if, if they're not doing at least 80% of their activity within, within their branch network, that rule applies. So it picks up activity that is important for some institutions, most institutions in the country do most of their lending within their um, facility-based assessment area, but it does have that flexibility that Marty pointed out that in the future, as the system evolves, we'll be able to, under the rule, capture that set of activity. Then we also pick up additional national lending through the outside um, lending uh, areas, and, and that picks up uh, quite a bit of activity that's not either in the retail lending assessment area or the facility-based assessment area. And then, as we mentioned, nationwide, uh, you can get uh, consideration for community development activities. So that's a way of making sure that the rule stays relevant uh, as the financial sector evolves. If there's more online banking, if there's more out of um, network, out of branch uh, area lending, um, it, it, it automatically, the rule automatically adjusts to pick up that kind of activity. And so I think that's really, really quite um, critical uh, for, for our approach. You know, in, in thinking about where to land on this, you know, there are lots of trade-offs involved, but we, we thought that the, the, the approach that we took continues to have the focus on facility-based assessment areas overall, and only picks up retail lending assessment areas if a bank is doing a significant amount of its lending outside of those facility-based areas. And that, that seemed to us a reasonable balance. 
invite others in on this point. And, and also you're going to have new data. I mean, I think that's really important. New deposit data, new community development uh, data, which which also I think informs uh, the evolution of the rule in the future. And I, look, it's why we I come back to it's really a transformative change here. Um, getting the data um, so that we can develop um, benchmarks for performance will add a rigor to the evaluation in the retail lending area as well as the the branch based. Uh, they will importantly complement the qualitative review, and I think. Both of these are important. The, 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 the data-based metrics and benchmarks um, capture a lot of the activity, but they don't tell you the whole story. And there can be shortcomings in the data and things the data doesn't capture. So you really need a qualitative aspect, which is provided in the rule to complement and balance and balance the data. And similarly, we talk a lot about the retail lending assessment areas, but as Michael pointed out, the foundation of bank activity remains in the branch-based area, and we do not want to lose our focus on that. We The rule specifically provides a valuation of banks, location of branches and LMI communities, or a decision to shift a branch out of an LMI community that goes into the CRA evaluation. And we don't want to look at only the physical location, but actually offering products and services beyond the branch location that are that are responsive to communities, including low-cost transaction accounts without overdraft fees to, you know, to get CRA credit and expand access to the banking system. So, you know, we've We've tried to make this a balanced rulemaking, uh, if possible, to, to strengthen CRA in, in all of its dimensions, and then add a few. Terrific, um, and and I think uh, I think that's so important. One one of the things we think is um, uh, the way in which this rule moves the conversation forward. In the past. You know, if uh, if a community organization were to comment on CRA performance. Uh, you, you sort of had to divine how the examiner came up with the exact grade. And a lot of the debate was about, well, what level of lending constitutes excellent or good or, you know, these sort of descriptive words um, that were used. I, I think now the conversation really shifts to, okay, here's a here's an expected level in terms of a, a, a clear benchmark. Um, now, can we really talk about the quality, responsiveness, and impact uh, of that lending? Um, and, and, and clearly, uh, you've raised the bar. I think the final rule estimates that, you know, if you were to retroactively apply it, 10% of banks would get a needs to improve. Probably many of those banks will improve their performance and, and, and not reach that outcome, which I think is, is, is a real positive. Um, so we've reached our time here. Uh, I wanna uh, thank the three of you all again uh, for your leadership, a, a major step forward, obviously, uh, and certainly if you've been paying attention to the chat, lots of issues of interest, lots of future issues um, that people wanna make sure are addressed um, and certainly we'll be doing a much deeper dive. We had here just an hour uh, with the three of you to, uh, uh, to start to, uh, uh, digest this rule, understand your thinking, what was important as people read it. So I, I just want to, uh, I just want to thank the three of you again uh, for your leadership and acknowledge your staff's leadership. Uh, you know, we we all get to sit here at the end and and <laughs> sit on the webinar, but uh, for for all of your staff, my staff, uh, our members, many of people spent hundreds of hours, thousands of hours. Um, uh, formulating this rule, offering their input into this rule, um, a, 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 a process that in, in its very nature involved compromise and considering different perspectives. And um, it's, a, it's a significant achievement to have navigated that. Um, that process has died under its own weight several times before. 
uh, sort of stand here at the finish line, uh, as, as you've all said, a very significant uh, moment. Um, so thank you again for your work to, to bring CRA into the 21st century, uh, um, something that in the short term raises lots of questions about transition and, 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 and how do we know how we're going to do before we do it for the first time. But I think in the long term brings a lot of clarity, transparency, and indeed uh, uh, simplicity, if I might even use that word. Um, uh, to certain factors within CRA while raising the rigor uh, uh, and difficulty in other ways uh, that, that we think are very responsive to community. Not that we're uh, uh, pleased with all aspects, certainly things we advocated for didn't make it. Uh, I think uh, we will continue the conversation about racial equity uh, in the context of CRA and, and in other contexts as well. Uh, but just want to acknowledge um, those as well. Um, so to those of you on the webinar, we, we appreciate your participation today. I uh, want to remind you that this is just the beginning. Uh, you'll receive a follow-up uh, email from us. Uh, uh, we appreciate your weighing in on what was most important uh, to you. Uh, and we uh, want to remind our members uh, to register for our deep dive uh, December 7th uh, webinar and, and to all of you uh, uh, to invite you to join us um, April 2 to 4 uh, in Washington, D.C. at the 2024 uh, Just Economy Conference. We expect we'll have ongoing uh, conversations about all of this. Uh, and then a reminder to, uh, to follow us on social media. So once again, I uh, just want to thank uh, the three principals of the agencies today for taking time out of their very, very busy schedules on short notice uh, to be here uh, with us. Uh, and with that, we will close. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you. Thank Jeff. you. Thanks.